We have a special uh, thing happening this weekend, uh, all throughout this weekend. We have nine of our band members in Asheville, North Carolina to what's called a new wineskins conference. And nine of our band members are there, and we still have, like, we, and we have five that are leading us in worship this morning. The Lord has gifted this community with so many just passionate followers of Jesus who are gifted in leading worship. So thank you, uh, the nine that are there and the five that are here. Um, they did this uh, three years ago, and they're, they're leading again, uh, again this year. And there's uh, New Wineskins is a mission conference for the Anglican Church uh, communion around the world. There are over 1,600 people there and over 2,000 that are live streaming. 300 kids, 18 and under. Missionaries from approximately 40 different nations from around the world. There's deacons, there's ladies, there's priests, there's bishops, there's archbishops from all of these different countries coming together to worship King Jesus. And on the commissioning service, the last service that they have, they're gonna have missionaries from, again, 40 countries. And they're being sent to parts of the world that are very hostile to the gospel. And they're standing firm and fast in Jesus. There's many of these. I was talking to Brandon before the service, and he was just saying it's so humbling to be in the presence of missionaries who face daily, weekly, monthly, yearly uh, the pressures of the possibility of losing their life for the sake of the gospel. It's humbling. And I'm just thrilled to say that we are part of uh, such a global communion that has a passion to see the gospel of Jesus Christ go to the distant nations to every reach, every corner, every nook and cranny of this globe to share the good news of the gospel. So Lord Jesus, we want to pray for all of those missionaries and for all of those that have gathered at New Wineskins, Lord. May your Holy Spirit fall afresh upon them as the light of your gospel encourages them, leads them, empowers them. Lord, by your grace, won't you minister to them and as they go back to the country that you have called them to serve. May they be reminded and may they know that they are not alone. Holy Spirit, that you are with them and that you have given them the promise that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And Jesus, for us here, may your blessings be upon us as we open up your word. Thank you for the book of 1 John. Thank you for the message of the word of truth because your truth is life, your truth is light, your truth is freedom. And God, may all things be done for the glory of your name. Amen. So last week we did the introduction to our sermon series on 1 John. And in this book we said there's a number of reasons why we're doing 1 John. I would say probably the most significant reason why we're in the book of 1 John is because it's all about discipleship. That what God is calling us into in this next season is a deeper level of discipleship, of holding firm and fast to the truth of the gospel and also living that out in a way that is consistent with what we believe. And I was reading a quote earlier this week, and it just has haunted me. And it wasn't necessarily the quote per se, but it was a word, mislive. And as I read this quote, that word mislive, that we're in danger of misliving, that word has just just haunted me. And I want to give you the quote. It's from William Irvine, who is a Stoic philosopher, actually. Don't believe in what he believes, but the quote is good. He says, Without a philosophy, there is danger that you will mislive. That despite all your activity, despite all the pleasant diversions you might have enjoyed while alive, you will end up living a bad life. There is, in other words, a danger that when you are on your deathbed, you will look back and realize that you wasted your one chance of living. Instead of spending your life pursuing something genuinely valuable... You squandered it because you allowed yourself to be distracted by the various baubles life has to offer. And that term, mislive, again, has just haunted me. So the question for us this morning is, how do we not only not mislive, but then not misbelieve, but believe rightly? And out of that right belief, live according to how God would call us to live. So we're doing, we're doing so, we're going to be looking at that question through the, through the lens of 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, and then all the way through chapter 2, verse 2. And I want to give you a little bit of a background, because 1 John is probably written by uh, the apostle, the, uh, John, who is the one that was called the one that Jesus loved. And we don't know for sure, because John never signed his name like Paul does. In his letters, Paul signs, you know, this is your beloved brother in Christ, Paul. 
But John never says, you know, I'm John, son of thunder, the one that Jesus loved, and don't you forget. I mean, he never, never signed his letters like that. But we, 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 we assume that it is this, the same one that wrote the gospel. It was the same one that Jesus loved. Uh, and we know that this historically, that he had a mentoree by the name of Polycarp, who was a bishop, by the way. A bishop. A bishop in the church. So if a bishop wasn't meant to be a part of the church, that means they got it wrong day one. Anyways, side point, secondary matter. But Bishop of Smyrna, his name was Polycarp. And we know from some of his writings that there was a heretic in his day. His name was Serenthus. And the Apostle John is writing to contrary uh, Serenthesis and his false teaching. Serenthesis was grounded in what was called Gnostic teaching. And what it basically did was take Greek thought and melded it together with Christian thought. And the Gnostic philosophy came from the Greek philosopher Plato, which basically said that the physical world is shadows, that the real world is the spiritual world, and that you need to get beyond this spiritual world, because this, or the, the physical world, because the physical world isn't that good. The spiritual world is what is good, so we need to escape the material and get into the, the world of the spirit, of thought, of the mystery of gnosis or a secret knowledge. And to the extent that you do that, then you have salvation. And as a result of that false teaching, you had all sorts of misliving taking place within the churches. And so John is combating that. He's coming against the false teaching that Serenthus is, is propagating. And it has a number of tragic implications. The first is one of Christology, our understanding of who Christ is, because biblically speaking, we believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man, fully human, and that God came in the flesh, veiled in flesh. God had, see, veiled in flesh, holy trinity, whatever that is. Okay, God in the flesh. That's what we believe. But the Gnostics, because they believed that flesh was bad, per se, that, that, that either Christ, Jesus, who was human, was, but you know, Christ came down, he, the, the, the human side was just a mere animation of, of, so it wasn't really flesh, it was just a, a, an animation, it was all spirit. Or what Serenthesis taught was, is that yes, you had the earthly Jesus, and the divine Christ came down at the baptism when the heavenly Father boomed from heaven and said, beloved, this is my son in whom I love and well pleased. But then he ascended right before the crucifixion because the Gnostics didn't have the framework to say that, that God could suffer. You know? God could not suffer, so therefore the divine Christ was ascended right before the human Jesus went through suffering. Now that had a number of implications. The first implication was that it had a diminished ethic because it had a low view of the body that whatever you did with the body, it really didn't matter. So you could unite yourself to a prostitute. What you did in the flesh really was inconsequential because the thing that really mattered was what was in the spirit. And because of the, the diminished ethic, you had people living any way that they wanted to live. But we know that biblically speaking, that, that, that's false. Because what Paul says is, is that, that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That matter matters. Creation is significant. And that we have a theology of creation. That Christ in the flesh died, was crucified, was resurrected, and ascended to the right hand of the Father in the flesh. But if we don't believe that, then you have a diminished ethic. But the second implication is that you also had diminished love. The, not, the Gnostics were notorious for being elite and bourgeois looking down their nose and anybody that was not like them, who didn't hold their same philosophy. They looked down their nose at those that, you know, worked with their hands because they were second-class citizens. So as a result, they didn't have a theology of caring for the poor or the oppressed. They didn't have a theology for uh, being advocates for justice. They didn't have a theology for caring for the least, the last, and the lost. They didn't have a theology for that because they didn't have a theology of the body. But Christianity comes along and says, no, because Christ died in the flesh, was resurrected in the flesh, we have a rich theology of the body, which means that we are not to have a diminished ethic, but a rich ethic of holiness, pursuing, being in the light as he is in the light, and also a rich theology of love, loving the other just as Christ has loved us. And some of this theology is, is, is revealed, um, the Gnostic theology is revealed in verses 6 8 and 10 of 1 John chapter 1, because what John is doing is he's coming against the false teaching of the gospels. And again, if you have a false belief, then you have a false praxis or a false life. You mislive because you have a misbelief. 
And this is what they were claiming in verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, if we have a diminished ethic, we lie and we do not live out the truth. That was one claim. Second claim is if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Next claim, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. Those are three claims that were coming from a, false, a place of false belief. And in the words of John Stott, he says, the first one in verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, really, I mean, what they were claiming was, in the essence of who I am, I am sinless. I've, I've achieved gnosis, you know, salvation. John says, no, that's false. This, the, the third claim, if we claim we have not sinned, that is in the body. We may not believe that we have sin in the essence but sin in the practice, that we haven't done those things, we haven't engaged in those things. And again, John comes against that, and he says that is a heretical view. And the point that John is trying to make is, is that anytime you bring together a worldly philosophy with Christian teaching, the result is heresy. Let me say that again. Worldly philosophy coupled with Christianity it will propagate heresy. And that's what's happening. That's the background of 1 John. We have that today in, in various forms. In fact, what I would see today is just the reverse of Gnosticism. Actually, it's another side of Gnosticism. If Gnosticism was placing too light of a value on the body, today what we have is too great of a value on the body, moving away from the spiritual, moving away from what our understanding of God is, and emphasizing everything in the imminent, like what is right here, right before my eyes. And we have a whole generation that is deconverting and walking away from their faith altogether. In a book, The Anatomy of Deconversion, John Marriott talks about a process of deconstructing your faith to the point of deconversion. And I'll say that over the course of 25 years of being a pastor, 21 years of being a lead pastor, I have had hundreds and hundreds of conversations with people who are in the process of deconstructing their faith, and it falls into one of these four categories. Now, he has about six or seven, and I've distilled it down into four. And this is what he would say is the process of deconversion or deconstructing your faith. It first begins with the context. In the context, it might be a, um, a macro context. It's a, it's, a, it's a strong resistance to your faith. If you think about Daniel, when Daniel went into Babylon, he had a strong resistance to his faith. They changed his name. They changed his education. They passed laws like you couldn't pray to anybody else except for Nebuchadnezzar. And so then what does Daniel do right after that law is passed? He goes right up into his room where everybody can see them, see him, and he gets down on his hands and knees and he begins to pray to Yahweh. I mean, why didn't you just do the curtain thing? But he doesn't. He resists the strong resistance that is coming against him. And as a result, he's thrown into the lion's den. But that's like a strong resistance to the faith. And it's happening all around us. I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, probably about a month, or actually a month or two ago, and he says, Billy, every time I go into my work context, there's just this strong resistance to any that sp anything that speaks of Christianity. Anything that speaks of like a, a holy ethic in regards to our sexual nature, what we're called to engage in sexually. Anytime I tell about like what my faith is all about, there's a strong resistance that comes against me, and it's just so exhausting. And here's the interesting thing is, is all of that is touted under this banner of inclusion. And what I have found is, is that that word inclusion is oftentimes just used until you're coming against what they're including of. And as soon as they're touting inclusion, then they become very exclusive, which means that they're not inclusive, they're exclusive. They're going against their, their own philosophy. They're not inclusive at all because they're exclusive of anybody that disagrees with them. Anyways, in the workplace... He's finding incredible, strong resistance against his Christian faith. But there also might be some subtle resistance as well. Maybe somebody grew up in a, a fundamentalist church where it's just all rules, no joy, no love, no grace. Or maybe that subtle resistance is just within your family or friends and it's pushing against your relationship with Jesus and what you hold fast to be true in the gospel. But anyways, there's this context that's pushing against your faith. And then it moves to the crisis moment where you experience some crisis in your life that disorients you. Maybe you, you lose somebody that you really, really love. Or you see within your friend group 
you know, non-Christians that are very, very nice and Christians that are just jerks. You're like, what's going on here? This is just disorienting. Like, what do I do with this? And by the way, you can't judge a religion by the abuses, but by the saints. You got to judge it by the saints. And if you take Christianity to its logical conclusion, what you get is Mother Teresa's, the John Ruchahanas, the Emmanuel Gassanas who are standing firm in their faith. But the process of deconstructing the faith will not only begin with context, but then it will go to crisis where you have some crisis and you're trying to wrestle through like, how does my faith apply to this situation? And then it moves to this third place, which is trying to retain my faith. And I seek to resolve the questions that I'm having and the experiences that I'm going through. And I'm having a hard time reconciling all of these mega themes in the scriptures of love and wrath and heaven and hell, human sexuality, a good and loving and a sovereign, all-powerful God, and also the presence of evil and suffering in the world. Like, how do all of these things come together? And I'm trying desperately to retain my faith. But the reality is that I feel like I'm in no man's land. I'm being pulled in one direction or the other. And I'm trying to seek resolution. And then where that resolution oftentimes sadly goes is to a reprogramming. That I resolve the tension by eliminating certain phase or truths that I grew up under. That I once believed. I eliminate those things. And I adopt a new narrative. And I take on some new stuff. And I meld it with Christianity. And I merge it to a new way of thinking, which leads to the last phase of finding my place in a new home, a new theological home. And it's just the reverse of Gnosticism. But the end result is still the same. Taking a worldly philosophy, merging with Christianity, and the result is heresy. The result is the deconstruction of my faith. And that's the trajectory that oftentimes people go. It's encouraging. (laughs) It's serious. It's deadly serious. In the midst of all of that, what John says is, in the midst of this, what he says is, in verse 5, this is the message that we've heard from him and declared to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Hold fast to the truth. In In the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, me. Not in the beginning, you. Not in the beginning, us. In the beginning, God. (laughs) Which means God is the one who is ultimate. God is the one who is the uncreated creator. God is the one who is all glorious, all powerful, all majestic, all glorious. He is the one in the beginning, God. And everything that comes from him is just contingent on or divergent of the one who created us, who is God. In the beginning, God. And what does it say about this God? This God is the God of light. He is the God of light. Now, it's not the created light. It's the uncreated light, that he is light. He is the eternal light. He is pure trinity, pure glory, pure love. And what light declares about the nature of God is that light speaks about the essence of who God is and light reveals the essence of who he is. The essence of our eternal God is light, that he is pure through and through and that he reveals himself to us. How do we know that? Because he's light. When you have light, you have the revelation and God is the essence of revelation. Andrew Hay, in his book, uh, God Shining Forth says, Light is God's radiant identity. It is the radiance of unity in the Trinity. And that just as light and radiance are one and undivided, you can't separate out the radiance from the light. They're united, they're one. So also you can't separate out the Father and the Son and the Son from the Holy Spirit. But just as the radiance precedes the light, so also the Son and the Spirit precede the Father. God is light revealing the essence of who he is, and also speaking to the essence of who he is. And all throughout the scriptures, we have it being declared that God is light. For example, Psalm 104, verses 2 through 3. 
The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. Ezekiel 1, 27, I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire. Brilliant light surrounded him. Brilliant light. He dwells in unapproachable light. If the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. It burns at 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And if the earth was just a little bit closer to the sun, the earth would burn up. And we can't even look at the sun for 15 seconds without our eyes getting burned out. I mean, it's, the sun is so intense. And yet that's created light. How bright and glorious is the one who created all things, who is light. And then Paul has the audacity to say about Jesus in 2 Corinthians for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Displayed in the face of Christ. So the light, God is light. He is all glorious. He reveals himself because he is light. Now, why does he do this? Now, what, what is the end result of this? The end result, it is connection. Because in verse 7, notice... Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His son purifies us from all sin. Because God is light, when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with him, connection with him, but we also have connection with one another. And it's the very thing that our hearts deeply long for and desire after is connection. Connection to God, connection with each other. Have you ever been in the mountains where you just can't get cell reception? And you're looking all over the house, you think, I, just, I can't get sick. But then on the corner of maybe the, the living room, you get one bar. And all of a sudden, your phone connects. And you get your text. And you're able to, to, to talk with your family or, or your friends. You, know, you, you have connection. It's in that one spot. And what we have is a world that's looking in every room to try to find connection. And what God says is, is I am your connection because I am the light. You come to me. You'll have the deepest desires of your heart filled. All the things that you long for are found in me, connected to me, and connected to one another. God is light. God is light, which means he knows every aspect of us. He knows the deepest recesses of our hearts. He knows our doubts. He's light. He knows our frustrations. He's light. He knows our concerns. He's light. He knows if we struggle with suicide, he's light. He knows our secret addictions, he's light. He knows the little things that we're holding on to, he's light. And the invitation that he's given us is to open up the rooms of our heart so that his light will shine through every recess of our soul. He's inviting us into a relationship with him. I saw this... Uh, image a couple weeks ago, and it just captivated my attention. Uh, this is Tanner's Annunciation. Now, I know that that light right there is, is, is Gabriel, but it's a divine light. I mean, it's, it's a picture. But think about the divine light. What, what captivated my attention was two things. First was the light. But secondly, it's Mary's face. I'm just drawn in by Mary's face. Why? At least for me, what I see on Mary's face is a desire to connect with the light. You know, she's not turning away completely. She's gazing at, she's looking at, but also she's looking kind of down. She realizes that she's humble, that she's not worthy of it. And in this picture, it's almost like you have the confession. Yes, this is what my heart is made for. And yes, I'm still broken. Yes, I still have sin. Yes, I still have things in my heart. And yet the light is beckoning her towards itself. It's powerful. And this is us. This is what God is doing to us. He's revealing himself to us and welcoming us into a deeper relationship with him. But how is that possible? You know, how is it possible to be connected to the one that we were created for and to be connected to one another? We have to have the right response. Right belief, God is light. Right response, it's a life of connection. It's a life of confession. It's in order to come into the life, in order to come into the light, 
We have to stop hiding in darkness. We've got to come out of the darkness and into the light. Into the light. And how do we do that? It's through confession. In verses 9 and then chapter 2. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sin, come into the light. But then chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is our atoning sacrifice for our sins. To come into the light, to confess our sins to confess our bitterness, to confess our desire for control, you know, to confess our anxieties, to confess our addictions, to confess those things. That's what we are called to do, to come into the light and out of the darkness. And this is the desire for all of our life groups, our women's groups and our men's discipleship groups, to be a people of confession, confession not only what we believe, but also the struggles to be deeply vulnerable. There is nothing worse than being in a lame life group where no one is honest with each other. I've been in one, I've led one. And you could tell that it's lame when you just can't wait for the thing to end. But have you ever been in a group where you just like, you don't want it to end? Because people are getting real. People are being transparent and vulnerable because there's a trusting, faith-filled environment, an environment of deep love that wants to connect with each other. There's nothing more enriching than being a part of a small group where you're able to be honest and vulnerable with your stuff, to bring it out into the light. And allow the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings healing to come to you through your community. There's nothing more powerful. One of the great privileges that we have as clergy is to be able to walk people through the reconciliation of the penitent. And it's such a powerful service. I've done this hundreds of times. There's 90% of the people that come in to go through the reconciliation of the penitent. They leave. 90% leave just in tears. Because they feel they came in under bondage. But now they leave in freedom. And just some of the words that are in this reconciliation of the penitent, the people cry out and they say, through the water of baptism, you clothed me with the shining garments of his righteousness and established me among the children in your kingdom. But I have squandered the inheritance of your saints and I have wandered far into the land that is waste. And especially I confess to you and to the church and the person just begins to confess their stuff. And after the confession, sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's a half an hour. They then say, therefore, O God, from these and all other sins I cannot now remember, I turn to you in sorrow and repentance. Receive me again into the arms of your mercy and restore me to the blessed company of your faithful people. Through him in whom you have redeemed the world, your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And then the pastor says, will you turn again to Christ as your Lord? I do. Do you then forgive those who have sinned against you? I do. And the priest says, may almighty God in mercy receive your confession of sorrow and of faith, strengthen you in all goodness, and by his power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And then the words are declared, now there is rejoicing in heaven, for you were lost and are now found. You were dead and now alive in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Go in peace. The Lord has put away all your sins. There's freedom. Come out of the darkness and in his glorious light. There's freedom. We have an advocate who's Jesus. We also have a prosecutor who's the devil. When you have an advocate, whatever happens to our advocate happens to us. If the attorney, the attorney's an advocate. If the attorney loses, you lose. If the attorney wins, you win. Jesus wins. He's your advocate. And when Satan, who is your prosecutor, comes against you and he says, you're worthless. You have an advocate that says, you're of infinite value. When then Satan says, you are empty, Jesus, your advocate, says you're full. When Satan, the prosecutor, says you are condemned, your advocate says you're saved. When the devil says you're an orphan, Jesus says you're a child. When Satan says you're lost, Jesus says you're redeemed. When Satan says you're guilty, Jesus says you're forgiven. When Satan says you're a throwaway, Jesus says that you are eternally glorious and precious in his sight. When Satan says, you are condemned and forgotten, Jesus says, you're loved. Come into my kingdom. And that's the power of walking in the light. But the light comes through confession. Right belief, God is light. Right living, what is our response? To be a people of confession. And as we are a people of confession, confessing not only what we believe, but how we've sinned and fallen short of his glory. We walk in the light as he is in the light, and we do so as a community. 
What I'd like us to do here uh, this morning is we're going to say the words of what we believe in the Nicene Creed. Because the Nicene Creed declares more clearly in all the other creeds that we believe in that God is light. God is light. And then we're going to take a minute to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal in our hearts where we need to confess our sin. And then we'll go into the confession. So let's stand. Let's stand as we declare what we believe about who God is in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate from the Virgin Mary, Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let's just remain standing and be still before the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal in our hearts where we've sinned, where we've strayed, And bring those before the Lord this morning. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor as we pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. And Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sin through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of His Holy Spirit, keep you in new and an ending life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And now hear the good news that Christ has given us. The affirmation of the good news of the gospel upon us who confess our sin. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. He who the Son sets free, she who the Son sets free, you are free indeed. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always.